I actually talked with real estate brokers that I know, and I actually had a conversation with my father. Everybody said, don't do it. The demographics aren't right. 10% occupied at the time, too much CapEx improvements in an area that wouldn't support the rents. I really didn't find anybody that had a real appetite for it. But you went and did it anyway. I ignored everybody and and moved (laughs) forward, which can sometimes be good. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Ryan Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 280. Today, I get to talk with one of my favorite people. What I admire about Alison Cotier is that she's extremely strategic in her approach to real estate investing, fearless in the type of projects she takes on, and creative in the way she structures her deals and works with her clients. Allison is also a top-selling multifamily broker with Compass Realty Services and has sold more multifamily real estate here in Grand Rapids in West Michigan in the past 10 years than any other broker. She's also a former board member of the RPOA and has been on the show many times. Allison, welcome back. Hi, Brian. Good to see you again. So it's been a while since you and I have actually talked on the show. I know you've done a number of panel discussions uh, at at the annual conference and those have been on here, but I I think it was way back in the first 50 episodes that you and I talked. I believe that's true. Yeah. So it would be great to just uh, get an update on on some of the the projects and investments you've been involved with recently. And I know that one of them is kind of uh, strategically looking at your entire portfolio and positioning it for the future. Yeah. So probably uh, five to seven years ago, I decided that I wanted to have an exit strategy with my father. We have bought uh, most of our own property together. So we worked out a buyout. And then after that came to be I kind of developed a a side strategy where I wanted to have all of my single family to small multifamilies paid off. So I wanted to have all my real estate free and clear. So I developed a strategy to sell off a few as the market would allow some of the ones that were a either poor performers or for whatever reason, didn't meet my needs anymore. So kind of outlined what ones would be the best ones to sell to actually have the portfolio paid off. And actually in January, sold a duplex, which actually created the final step in that strategy to make all those properties free and clear. Wow. So that, that's a big undertaking. And you had, you, I think between you and your father, uh, you had at least 40 properties. That is correct. The two of you were kind of uh, linked together because you own these properties together, but you were trying to both at the, uh, separate them and then go your own way with your portfolios at the time. That must have been a massive undertaking to, to figure that out. Yeah, so that's what I always tell people. If you, if you have a partner, it really is important to have some sort of exit strategy. Now, having said that, we did not have one when we, when we started, but we developed one. So we actually worked with a uh, business evaluator and he helped us determine, you know, kind of the value of the portfolio and what would be a reasonable buyout strategy that was fair to both of us. That was very important to us that, you know, it made sense and it worked for both of us as far as tax implications for him and, you know, the ability to buy him out. That made sense to me. That wasn't going to be a financial obstacle to myself. So we actually enlisted the help of, you know, an outside business evaluator Mark Andreski, who has actually, I believe, been on the show also previously, and he helped us evaluate that portfolio. So when you evaluated it with Mark, um, what were some of the surprises that that you found? I mean, did you know exactly what you were getting into and what your portfolio held? Um, You know, what did Mark point out to you? I guess there was no, I guess, true surprises, but we have always, you know, done our numbers and, you know, done profit and loss and, and that type of thing. 
uh, Mark did a better job of taking all of that and then extrapolating that out over future years. So based on past performance, what do the future years look like? Which cash flow are you, what cash flow are you really going to have? You know, what is it really going to cost? You know, my father and tax implications, what benefits do I get in a step up and basis? So that was kind of instrumental to how we structured that, that buyout. And then my father has a wife that's younger than he is. So, you know, kind of making sure that, you know, it benefited her also and that we would all be happy with that. Yeah, it seems like when you have different parties, it, it can get complicated because everybody is coming at it from a different perspective. Everybody on, on the decision making team is making a decision based on on different parameters. Yeah, in different, different levels of experience or comfort in real estate. And that's you want. And that's, I guess, the thing that I learned through this process is. Um, and un- unfortunately, um, my father recently passed away. Uh, last October, unexpectedly. So it was really beneficial that we had worked that out previously so that it did not create any issues between myself and his ex-wife. So that was just, I mean, those things are hard enough. I worked with my dad for 20 plus years, you know, I've seen him every day. So those things are hard enough to work through without adding some big, you know, financial strife on it that, you know, we would have had to argue about, or I would have had to liquidate a bunch of properties I wasn't prepared to do, but it was, it was all done. So it was, it was seamless. There was nothing to discuss. And we all, I think, underestimate the value of that. And you do not want to set, you know, your partner up or your spouse or your loved one to fight with your uncle, brother, spouse, whatever, when you're gone. So I, I think it's, it's very important to make sure those those things are spelled out. It's really great that you were able to um, work this out in advance with your dad and his wife to to figure out, okay, what do we want? What do you want? And uh, was that were those difficult conversations to have? Because I know with some people, uh, and I've talked to a number of real estate investors who their their spouse really isn't active in the business like they are. And if something happens to them, there, there's a big question mark as to what happens to that portfolio. Who takes care of it? How's it going to be operated? Did you have difficult conversations or, or did you find that you and your dad were both on the same page? For the most part, he and I were on the same page. I mean, there was a few, you know, I guess uh, bumps to get over hurdles to, you know, what are we both really entitled to moving forward? And, you know, how are we going to decide the value? So there was some, but you know, we've had a, you know, a great relationship and like I said, spent a lot of time working together. So it was certainly probably better than most of those conversations would go for most people. Probably helps that you're both experienced seasoned real estate investors and brokers. So when it came to putting a value on the different assets, uh, you could, you just have to pull, pull comps and you could easily do that. Yes. And, and my, my father's um, wife has always been very supportive of our endeavors, just not very involved. So um, it was just a matter of, you know, making sure that, you know, she felt that it was equitable, you know, for her also, if, if and when my dad would, you know, pass. So what advice do you have for people who, who are in a similar situation? They have a partner ready to maybe go their separate ways. They have different objectives for their real estate investing. How would you recommend they, they approach that conversation, have that conversation, and, and what are some of the choices they're going to have to make? Some of it depends you know, on the, on the relationship they have and what their investment goals were in the future, meaning you know, if this other person you know, passes away in the next six months or a year, you know, are you okay selling everything and just splitting it up? Or do you want to move the portfolio forward intact and whichever is the surviving member wants to, wants to keep that? So we all want to think that, you know, we're going to go on, you know, forever. And, you know, even for me, like I said, we got the buyout done, but um, my father is, uh, was one of the trustees of my trust. And so once he was gone, he's the only one that really knows where all my rental property are. So that has forced me even beyond the buyout with him, you know, to get down on paper, you know, this is what I own. This is where it is. This is who manages it. This is who you need to contact. These are the bank accounts I have. 
just so that, you know, my mother would be able to do something with that if I passed. Um, and I think it was fortunate for my, you know, my dad's wife that, you know, I know all about my dad's real estate holdings and, you know, where he was with everything. So without that knowledge too, I think is a, a thing that a lot of people don't think about. We just, we all never know how long we're going to be here. And you just, you don't want to leave that messy ball with somebody, especially in real estate with, you know, we have our hands in so many different cookie jars. That's an excellent point. I mean, you're next in line now. So did you put it in a trust? I mean, what exactly did you do? Did you put it in a legal document? Did you leave it with your management company? How do you convey that to the next in line after you? So I have a trust. So, um, you know, my son is the beneficiary of my trust and, um, my mother and father were joint, um, trustees on my trust previously. Um, but now it's just my mother. So, you know, she, and there's certain outlines on when my son would get certain percentages of, of cash. And then it will be up to him at a certain age based on the trust guidelines to decide whether he's going to sell the portfolio or portfolio or keep it. Um, but he's in a, I always say that I don't want to ever tell him, but he probably is really in a position that he, Probably would never have to work a day in his life. So that's the legacy that, you know, real estate investing and wealth building can, can give to your heirs. It's pretty amazing. You've built this legacy wealth. You built it with your father. You then went through the process of separating it, but then you took it a step further to secure it, um, whether it be by selling off some of your underperforming assets so you could pay off the others and own them free and clear. I mean, what? how exactly did you strategically go about looking at your portfolio once once you had it all in front of you? I just broke down, you know, all the properties and a lot of the properties I've owned for, at that time when I was looking at it, had owned for at least five years. So I had quite a bit of history with these properties and knew, you know, which ones had, you know, maybe you know, some capital improvements that had to be made. But for the most part, you know, most of the properties were, you know, sided, new windows, you know, in, in, you know, above average repair as far as rental properties go. So it was pretty easy to look at, you know, based on the rents and where we were, what is this property really going to throw off? I think before when I talked with you, I've talked about, um, real returns and paper returns. So, you know, the returns you get when you're going to buy a new property from the previous owner and you get their expenses and you get this really juicy number at the bottom and then you buy the property and you never see that juicy number again. (laughs) So I actually had, you know, a lot of hard real data of what these properties were really, really throwing off. And I had already kind of worked into, you know, my portfolio, kind of what I call some, you know, CapEx and, Count. So I have a formula where, you know, each month, a certain amount of money, you know, immediately gets, you know, directed to a CapEx account for my property. So, you know, that's going to cover roofs, furnaces, hot water heaters, you know, those major expense. So those don't really come out of, you know, cash flow per se. And the same with, you know, taxes. And so those big expenses are all already taken care of on a monthly basis. I don't have to think about it. You know, that money's automatically gets diverted to those accounts. So it's there. So that allowed me to really see what I was getting each month from each property. So then I looked at which of these properties do I really want to own long term based on where they are or what they are, or the tenants they attract, or for whatever reason, you know, I, I just like them better or w- whatever that reason was. And then there was some that were maybe in areas that I wanted to get out of. Um, or maybe there was some that just based on the layout or just something that was going on in that neighborhood. I just didn't like that fit long-term. So I identified those properties. And then based on that, looking at which ones were more profitable, kind of came up with a list of, okay, these are properties I would potentially sell. And then kind of went through, are these properties that I want to get the tenant out of now and sell? Or are these properties that I'm going to wait till the tenant gets out of? And then at that time, I'm going to fix them up a little bit and and resell them. Because as most investors know, if you can sell a property to an owner-occupant, you're typically going to make a higher profit than if you're selling to another investor. When you started this process early on, you you and your dad were still managing a lot of these properties. Like when I first met you, I think you were managing all your properties and you slowly started turning them over to a, a third party professional management company. Uh, where are you in that process? So I don't manage any of um, my properties anymore. So they're all uh, managed by third property management and, uh, 
a, a little bit dependent. My local portfolio, I have a little more hands-on in the fact that I will get my own contractors involved in any turns that happen. And I will do a lot of my own um, maintenance to my own contractors here locally. Uh, I do have a 12 unit north and a 48 unit south of here. And those are, you know, I'm 100% hands off on those properties. Does that mean you could basically go to Europe for six months and not pay any attention to your, your properties other than maybe there's a roof that needs to be replaced and you call it, call your roof guy? I mean, are you, are you in that place now where you can just be passive? Yes. And I could set it up such that, you know, I would just insert my contractor into my place, you know, that's doing the repairs here and he would get those calls. So yes, I could pretty much disappear and it would continue on. Any other advice as far as creating that, that system that that you've created? Well, like I said, I think it's, again, it's being clear on what your investment strategy is, meaning, you know, why are you doing this in the first place? You know, are you looking to put your kid through school? Are you looking to diversify? Are you looking for cash flow, retirement income? Are you looking to have, you know, a legacy that you can pass on to your kids? And I think that depends on A, how many properties you own. And I think, so that was part of the reason for kind of downsizing my portfolio a little bit was um, I just decided that I, I didn't need 40 properties to get where I, where I wanted to go. I didn't need to pay them all off or I didn't need to have that many. So even though, you know, I'm not actively managing any of them, they, you know, there's occasionally decisions to be made or, you know, things happen. So there is, you know, there can be, if you want to be, you know, some involvement. So sometimes the less that you have, the less involvement you have to have. So for me, I decided, okay, I don't need that many properties to get where I want to go. So I'm going to sell the ones I don't want to get down to a more manageable number from a equipment standpoint. And that helps me meet my goals. So I talked before about, you know, some people think, well, they want to own a hundred. Okay. Well, that's, that's great. Do you need to own a hundred or are you better off with just 10 well-managed paid off properties? Is that enough for what you want to do? I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is healthcare for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole healthcare insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best healthcare options. And best of all, his services are covered by the the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. So I want to talk about your 48 unit, which is in Southern Michigan. And uh, this, this is an addition to your portfolio that you were, you know, being very strategic about. You also took on a 48 unit rehab in Southern Michigan, which is probably what, about two hours away from Grand Rapids? Correct. And I remember this clearly because before you got into it, you had, you had told me about it. And I said, oh, no, no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> it's too far away. It's in the middle of nowhere. You don't want to be driving there. And I know other people warned you against it, too because you've told me that. Yeah, I, I actually talked with some uh, real estate brokers that I know, and I actually had a conversation with my father. And um, everybody said, don't do it. The demographics aren't right. The, the vacants, there was, it was 10% occupied at the time. Um, just thought it'd be too much, you know, CapEx improvements um, in an area that wouldn't, you know, support the rents. So I really didn't find anybody that had a real appetite for it. But you went and did it anyway. 
I ignored everybody and, and moved forward, <laughs> which can sometimes be good. Now, I think it's always good to get, you know, advice, but ultimately you have to, you know, run your own numbers and be your own counsel. And you had a, there was a partner who you were working with on this as well. Correct. Yes. Tell us what happened there, because this was a major undertaking. Um, like you said, 10% ocup- occupancy, um, major problems that you needed to to deal with at this property. Why did you decide to do it despite everyone's warning against it? And what happened? Well, so I, I went and visited, you know, the, the property. And for me, I thought the community would support some, high, when I say higher end, um, I mean, higher end in that area. So what I mean is remodeled units. So, you know, super basic units. Like B, B, taking a C property and turning it into a B type property. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so thought the market was there, thought it was underutilized as far as rental units and that there was a a big enough draw to the area that people would be there. And, And what did you see in the community that made you think that? Well, just some of the infrastructure as far as, uh, jobs, you know, the, Things you want in a small community, you know, Meyer, Walmart, you know, a couple of fast food places, and you know, a little bit of that kind of small town feel. So, and the upside to me was that although you know, you know, the occupancy rate you could see as a detriment, but that allowed us to very quickly redo. Uh, I think we ended up rehabbing. 46 of the 48 units. I mean, virtually did them all. So that meant, you know, new windows, you know, new roofs, all the units, you know, vinyl plank, uh, you know, new counters, everything's painted, new, you know, fixtures, everything is brand, basically brand new. So the ongoing maintenance costs over time, I knew would be very low. And I knew that, you know, these were, again, being super small units would be easy to turn. So your turn costs would be low. Again, that was also based on the way we rehabbed them. So I just felt the holding costs moving forward would would be low. And the strategy from the start was to, you know, put the money in and then, uh, you know, do a cash out refund. I think my concern was just because it's two hours away and it's a smaller community, finding people to do the work, like uh, honest, ethical capable people to actually go in and turn those units and do the work and then oversee it. To me, that seemed like a massive undertaking, but you didn't seem daunted by it. And how did that work out? I'm actually fairly well. So I have enough connections that we're able to pull some contractors um, from other areas who, because the project was so large, you know, they were going to go down and do, you know, 30 floors that um, they were willing to take that job, even though it was further from their home base. And, you know, based again on the volume, what we were giving, we're able to negotiate a little bit of a discount over, you know, one unit because they could go in and, you know, basically they could start wherever they wanted. I mean, you know, there's vacant units everywhere. So, you know, pick one and, and start. So I think that allowed them some flexibility in how they did the job, even had some contractors that actually stayed down there for a week, you know, here and there to, and just, worked pretty much nonstop. So that, I mean, there was some, you know, there's always some hiccups with, with contractors I have found as most people who've done this long enough have, but for the most part that went as smooth as it could go. Did you have any, any horror stories, any real problems along the way? Not really. It took a little longer than we wanted, cost a little bit more than we wanted it to. You know, I think in the end, we probably put four or 450 into it to get everything to where you know where we wanted it to go. So that's about ten thousand per door, then just under ten thousand yeah. a door that you Probably put into it, here. plus your acquisition. And and how did it turn out for you? Because I did you prove everyone wrong? So the real beauty of the project is that so at about a year and a half in, uh, did a cash out refi and got entire down payment, all the rehab costs. And I don't know, probably another fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars back. So now I'm into this project for no money, basically out of my pocket, and very nice check every month. So, so you've achieved the the holy grail, which is infinite return. Correct. You you no longer have any of your own money into this deal, and it's giving you a check every month. 
Exactly. It's, there's, it's impossible to calculate the return on that because you don't have any money into it. So that is fantastic. Congratulations on that. So Allison, I know that um, last week uh, we had our first of 12 episodes of our annual conference. We spread it out over 12 months. Um, by the time this comes out, we'll probably have had one or two more since then. But you had a booth for your Compass Realty Services. And you shared three suggestions that will take your real estate investing to a whole new level. Um, What were those three things? I'm not sure a whole new level, but they are three things that I think are very important for new and even seasoned investors. And I think even if you're already along on your real estate journey, that they're important things to look at. And the first for me, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, was making sure you have an investment strategy or goal. And it doesn't mean that that can't change throughout time, but if you decide, you know, what you want, if that's $5,000 a month or $10,000 a month or $30,000 a month, whatever that is that you want your cash flow to be, or you want to own four houses so you can sell one each time one of your four kids goes to college, whatever that is, if you keep that in mind, I think that really helps you get where you're going and also helps determine what type of investment you should own. I mean, should it be single families or duplexes or 48 units or what is that? You know, do you need a partner or don't you, are you just going to rehab houses and, you know, take, take the profits and use that. So I do think it's very important to set that goal. And then the other thing, you know, the biggest mistake I see real estate investors make time and time again is calculating property taxes. And obviously there are some differences from, from state to state, but just make sure that you know what the taxes will be after you close. So in, especially in Michigan, we have something here called uncapping. So depending on how far away your taxable value and your state equalized value are, you may buy a property where you think the taxes are going to be $1,500 a year. And it turns out after you own it, they're $4,500. So, you know, you look at that, you know, additional $250 a month to you, you know, that makes a huge difference in whether your real estate investment is successful or not. So just always cautioning investors to make sure that, you know, you know what that cost will be for you once you are the owner. And then I'm a big proponent of building teams. So find a mentor or a realtor that is successful doing what you want to do and, enlist their services, whether that's in, you know, you take them to lunch or free advice, or you're, you know, a paid consultant, or you're going to pay a realtor, however, you're going to do that, but make sure you have someone who, you know, knows what they're doing and can help advise you along the way. And just to emphasize your, your tax comment, definitely that's the number one mistake I see investors making is not understanding how their property taxes will change once they take possession of the property. As a broker, I'd assume that you probably make sure your clients are aware of that. Yes. Yeah, so um, I actually have a, a couple of things. I always talk to people about, you know, what that will be. And then um, I always try to give everyone I'm working with, I kind of call it a real estate 101 handout that I give people that just talks about some of the basic things that are specific to Michigan that they may or not be aware of. I work with a lot of out of state investors. So that, you know, rental certification, uncapping, um, you know, how you can transfer your property with property transfer affidavits and how you can create an uncapping event that you didn't want to, how to appeal your property taxes. But geez, just to make sure that I've touched on everything, that they know that these things may come up and then we can talk about them in greater detail as we move through the process. You know, right now we're, we're recording this at end of February of 2021. It's a screaming hot market. I mean, it's 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 amazing that this market has just been screaming hot for at least the past five years, but it still is. What are the conversations you're having with your clients as, as a broker, multifamily broker, and the top selling multifamily broker over the past 10 years uh, here in West Michigan? What are the, the, com- the, the conversations like when someone calls you and says, I want to invest in multifamily? Well, the conversation is, is different than it obviously would have been at the downturn when properties were really cheap. But the main thing is I tell people is you can still make money in real estate. It's just it's not going to be instantaneous for the most part. So you have to have a longer term strategy, especially now. I mean, I think that anytime you're a buy and hold investor, I think that's a good strategy anyway. But I think especially in this market, it's going to be really hard to buy something today and, you know, 
get out of it next year and have it be, you know, super successful. So trying to make sure that people have the right, um, you know, time frame and appetite for that, you know, that people can be a little patient. And then making sure that I think that what they're going to buy can really meet that investment strategy. And so I get people and they say, oh, I want to buy something, you know, for cash flow. And I want to buy a property that I'm doing anything to. And, you know, I want to get $500 a door. Well, that's not going to happen in this market. So a lot of times my conversation with people is that's just not, could you find that one in a hundred properties that is going to do that? Sure but that's probably not going to happen. So trying to have people be realistic about what they can expect in this market. And in some ways, that's probably why I do work with a lot of out-of-state investors. You know, you're comparing a California market to a Michigan market. So you think of what you can buy out in California for 300,000, which first what you can buy in Michigan for 300,000. So depending on where you are, it, it can be much more appealing. Just to bring back us back around to the 48 unit, you did achieve a relatively quick upside on that property. What, what's the difference there? Is it because it was in a tertiary market? Is it because you went in and spent $10,000 a door to, to improve it? I mean, wh- why were you able to capitalize on that so quickly? I think both of those things. I think just right place at the right time. I think that is where everything converged perfectly and I had not seen before or hence anything like that. And that was part, I think that was the other reason for me. It was um, even though everybody said no, it was easy for me to say yes, because I, I just, I didn't see a lot of risk there based on the price that we were coming in at. So even had it not went as well as it went, and I probably wouldn't have anticipated that it went as well as it did, but I didn't anticipate that there would be a loss. You know, so I thought worst case scenario, you know, this is a break even small profit situation. And I thought that was like worst case scenario. So that was kind of the other reason, but I thought, but the upside I thought was pretty sweet. So you were able to mitigate your risk uh, pretty well. Correct. So I think that was the big upside for me. But anyway, Allison, I want to talk about your dad, Tom, who I miss very much. And, and my condolences to you because I know you must miss him uh, quite a bit as well. Um, he was very, very uh, important and instrumental to the growth of the RPOA. Uh, he was president of the RPOA for many, many years, sat on many boards and committees. Um, I know I got started in the RPOA because of him. I, I could go on and on about Tom, but I wanted to bring up the RPOA scholarship in his name because we have, uh, I I just want our listeners to know, and especially people in the West Michigan area, we've created the Tom Coetzeer Real Estate Investor Scholarship. And we'll be giving this away at our annual conference. And it's basically a free uh, yearly membership, including the mastery program, so people can listen to all of our classes or watch all of our classes online or attend them in person. And uh, there'll be more more coming out about that, but I I just wanted to, uh, tell you, you know, how, just how important your dad was to me and, and obviously was to the RPOA. Well, thank you. I mean, he certainly is the reason that I started in real estate. Uh, you know, he came to me one day and he said, hey, I think we should buy some rental property. And I thought, really? Why would we do that? And uh, so for me, you know, the ability to work with, you know, someone that you trust implicitly and, uh, you know, I think we learned from each other over the years. We both got got better because of each other and that growth and just, I mean, it's changed my life. I mean, it, it's changed how I live my life every day, how I, you know, spend money, the, the free time I have, the my son's life. I mean, the ability, you know, I've been in a fortunate situation to, you know, volunteer all my kids things. You know, I never miss a swim mate because I'm working. You know, I have the ability to, to travel and do those things that some people don't have. And that's, for me, it's really all through real estate. Yeah. And, and it's because he decided one day to just say, Hey, let's, let's yeah. invest together. <laughs> Cause he thought, you know, he had done, you know, he would, he's always kind of been entrepreneurial and had, had done some things in the past and was definitely attracted to the idea of, of passive income. Um, and I think most people are, <laughs> But, you know, to actually, you know, take the steps and, you know, it was great to have someone to go down that path with. I mean, we did, you know, I sit here now and it, you know, it sounds all rosy and wonderful, but, you know, we definitely made a lot of mistakes and I have, you know, turned a lot of units. So I don't, 
I always kid people right now that if I walked into a rental property and the light switch was loose and I even had a screwdriver, I probably wouldn't tighten it. I'd probably call somebody else. <laughs> um, but in the beginning, you know, I painted all our units. I mowed the lawns. I used to put a lawnmower in the back of my station wagon and drive it around the city and mow the lawns. So, you know, I think that experience and, you know, working through all those things, you know, helps you learn a lot about, you know, real estate investing and what, what it really takes. Any stories that stick out from that, that early beginning with you and your dad investing in real estate? I do remember one time we uh, were turning a unit and uh, it was probably not in the greatest neighborhood. And, and we thought it would be um, great to, you know, enlist some, some help from our family. So we got a few people to come over with us and, um, Apparently they are not familiar with owning real estate and properties in not great areas. And it was just disgusting. So just listening to the people that we brought over and all the things they said, um, we realized we're just going to do this on our own. <laughs> and you certainly did. And it, and it certainly worked out well. Um, any, any advice for our listeners? Well, I, I touched on building a team. And I think part of that is, you know, the Rental Property Owners Association for me has been wonderful as far as an education. Uh, both my father and I participated in the mastery courses. Uh, he and I are both, you know, he previously and, and me previously and currently are teaching those courses. So passing that along, but just the things you can learn from that. And the network you, you can do and the relationships you can make. I, you know, I made some great friends with the RPOA, learned a ton, done a lot of deals. And I think that especially for, you know, investors, that's a great way to continue networking. And for, you know, my father and I, we, we built an entire real estate business basically through the RPOA. I am one of those realtors who essentially don't advertise except through the RPOA and word of mouth. And I, you know, I have more clients than, than I can want. And, and how would people get a hold of you? Um, so you can reach me through my website, teamcoatseer.com, T-E-A-M, coatseer, K-O-E, T as in Tom, S as in Sam, I-E-R.com, or my personal email, acoatseer at compass101.com. Great. Well, Allison, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate you coming back to the show to talk about your strategic overview of your entire portfolio and how you and your dad were able to kind of separate the assets and, and position them basically for long-term growth and legacy wealth. I mean, that that is so key and that's the goal for everyone. Uh, congratulations on your 48 unit, which you, you proved everyone wrong, including me, and I'm so glad you did on that. And, and, you know, just sharing your, your wisdom and your knowledge with us. It's been a pleasure talking with you. All right. Thanks, Brian. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com and RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review. 